Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of the Linux hands-on series. In the previous part, we showed you how to set up a Linux environment on your local machine and then we went over some of the basic commands which included creating and navigating between directories, creating and removing files and a couple of neat little tricks. This week we are going to level up and build on top of what we learned last week. We are going to take a look at manipulating and handling files which includes adding content to a file, archiving files, etc. And then we'll also take a look at processes in the Linux world, how they work, how to view them and kill them. And then we'll close the video off by taking a look at one of the popular text editors built into the Linux terminal. So without further ado, let's get started. Before getting started with part two, let me make a quick disclaimer. This series has been structured in a manner in which all the consecutive parts build on top of each other. Which means that if you've not checked out part 1 of this series, part 2 might not make complete sense. So unless you've gone through part 1 of the series or have some familiarity working around Linux, do not proceed with part 2. Just like all of the other parts, we'll have a companion blog post which details out each command and their explanation in a structured manner linked right below in the description. Having said that, let's get started. Last week, we checked out how you can create files, delete them and navigate between directories. Let's get started this week by seeing how you can view the contents of a file. To do that, we use the cat command. The textbook definition of this command is that it sequentially reads a file and prints the content out to the standard output. Let's use an example to see how the cat command works. Let's check out the contents of this directory using ls and as you can see, I have two text files here. Let's check out the contents of the file ghost.txt. To do so, I'll type cat and the file name and hit enter. And as you can see, it prints out the contents of the file. Similarly, to check out what the file starwars.txt contains, I'm going to type cat starwars.txt and then hit enter. And as you can see, it printed out the output. That's all that there is to the cat command. Let's clear the console and move along. Well, now that we know how to view the contents of a file, let's see how you can add contents to the file. Before doing that, let's list out our files. And let's list out the contents of the file ghost.txt. And as you can see, the file is pretty empty right now. So let's go ahead and add something in there. Shall we? All right. So in order to add contents to a file, we are going to use something known as the redirection operator. What the redirection operator means, it takes the output of a command as the input for a source file. If that does not make sense, don't worry. We'll check it out using a demo. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and do an echo and let's say hello world and I'm going to use the output of the echo command as input to a file ghost.txt. Now before I hit enter, let's break it down. Hello world is the output of the echo command here and that will serve as the input to the file ghost.txt. So if I hit enter now and then do a cat on ghosts, you can see it now contains hello world. If I go ahead and repeat the command, let's say good morning. And now if I do a cat, you can see the contents were replaced instead of getting appended. This is because this particular redirection operator works in the overwrite mode. Well, what if you don't want your contents to be replaced? There's a redirection operator which does. Let's check it out. I'm going to do an echo and let's say, how are you doing today? And instead of using the previous symbol, we're going to use this. And now let's do an enter and let's cat. And as you can see, Instead of replacing the contents, it just appended it to the end. Well, this was pretty neat, right? Without using a text editor, 
we just saw how you can add contents to a file. Let's move along. Now that we know how to add contents to a file and how to view them, how about learning how to find the files in a file system? To do that, we use a command called find. If you man the find command, it says the find utility recursively descends the directory tree for each path listed and evaluates an expression to check against to find files within the file system. If that doesn't make sense, let's jump in straight to the demo. So I'm on a Mac and it's pretty rare that a person using a Mac will have an exe file. But just for the purpose of this video, let's say I have a couple in my file system. Now in order to find that, I'm going to use the find command. And here's how it works. So the basic syntax for the find command is you type in find, then you specify the path and then the name of the file as a matching target. Before I hit enter, let's break it down. The first input that is given to the find command is the path of the directory where the file is to be searched for. The second is the name option, which tells the find command what type of file you're trying to search. And if I hit enter now, you can see it has listed out the two exe files that I have in my desktop. Now, if I go ahead and let's just change from the desktop to my entire file system and then hit enter, let's see what it comes up with. And as you can see, it returned a lot more files this time since the target set was larger. Do note, however, that this is not the only use case of the find command. And it's going to apply to almost all of the commands that we're going to cover in this video and in the upcoming parts. I'm only going to list out the general use case, which would work, let's say 60% of the times for all of you. If you want to dive in deep and customize the way a command works, you can go ahead and man the command, find out the description of all of the options, and then fine tune the results based on your needs. This is being done for the sake of brevity and to make sure that you learn more number of commands instead of learning extensively about a single command. Having said that, let's move along. Well, now that you know how to find files, how about we learn how to find stuff within a file? To do that, we'll use the grep command. grep stands for global regular expressions. And while regular expressions will be covered in a future part, the basic explanation for what it means is that it's just a template that grep uses to check all of the strings in a file to match against. All right, so let's test out the grep command. All right, so first let's list out all the files in our directory. And as you can see, we have two of them. So let's list out the contents of each file and so we're going to work with the first file and let's go ahead and add a line to the first file in the append mode. Let's. And as you can see, we have two lines in the file. Let's clear the console out, have it printed out to the screen. And now let's use grep. So grep will basically let us find a phrase within the file. So let's say we need to find the phrase ho in the file ghost.txt. Let's just hit enter. And as you can see, it found that particular phrase in the first line itself. Now you might be wondering that that same phrase is also present in the second line, but it didn't print it out. That is because grep is right now working in the case sensitive mode. In order for grep to ignore case, we're going to use the minus i option. And now if I hit enter, it's going to recognize the phrase in both the sentences. Again, this is a very basic use case of the grep command. So I highly suggest that you man it out and dive deep for a more sophisticated result. Let's clear the console out and move ahead. Next, let's see how you can actually compare two files in a line by line fashion. We're going to work with the same files. So let's cut them out. And now we're going to compare uh, the two files. Uh, to do that, we use something known as the diff command. 
before going ahead with the diff command let's man it out and see what it says and as you can see the description of the diff command is that it compares files line by line all right so here's a basic use case you type in diff and then supply the first file name followed by the second one let's hit enter and the output might not make perfect sense in the first go so let's break it out the first line of the diff command contains the line number corresponding to the first file a letter a for add c for change or d for delete and then the line number corresponding to the second file in this output we have 2c1 which means line 1 through 2 needs to be changed in the first file so that it matches the contents of the second file all right now that we have learned the diff command let's move along next we'll see how you can find the repeated lines in a file along with their count and other similar details to do that we use the unique command as you can see the unique utility reads the specified input file comparing adjacent lines and writes a copy of each unique input line to the output file what this basically means is that unique will parse a given input file and find the recurring adjacent lines within a file. We have the file starwars.txt in this directory. Let's cut it out. And as you can see, we have two lines which are repeated. Now, in order to detect this repetition, we are going to use the unique command with the minus C option. Let's break down the command and the output. So the minus C option along with the unique command basically tells it to print a count of the number of times a particular line was repeated and as you can see in the output it says that it was repeated twice again this is a very minimal usage for the unique command and you can fine tune it more with the available options let's move along all right we are nearing the end of the file handling part of the video and one of the most important things to learn about file handling is about access rights and scopes you see you just cannot allow global access to all of your files. Some files are system critical and if they are modified, your system might behave weirdly. So in order to prevent unauthorized people from accessing or making amendments to a file, we basically change the permissions of the file. In this directory, we have a couple of files here. So let's do an ls-l on starwars.txt. And as you can see as of now, that this file does not have any permissions whatsoever. So permissions revolve around three scopes, user, group, and other. And each of these scopes have three permissions built in, which is read, write, and execute. So let's go ahead and use the chmod command to actually add permissions to this file. Before I hit enter, Let's break down the command. So as you can see, we have supplied some options to the chmod command and they are separated by commas. U stands for user, G stands for group and O stands for others. And we use the assignment operator in the form of the equal to sign to assign each permission to these scopes. R stands for read, W stands for write and X stands for execute. So in this case, we are providing a complete access to the user, a read and execute access to the group. And for the others, you are just providing read access. Let's hit enter and let's go ahead and check the permissions out again. So as you can see, the permissions have now been changed from basically nothing to the ones that we specified with the chmod command. There's another way in which chmod works and that is using the octal notation. In the octal notation, number 4 stands for read, number 2 stands for write, 1 stands for execute, and 0 stands for no permission. I would recommend you to go ahead and check the details of the octal representation in the companion blog post. But here's how it adds up in a practical users. So let's go ahead and do a chmod 755 star So before we actually go ahead and check the uh, status of the permissions right now. Uh, let's break it down. As I said, a 4 stands for read, a 2 stands for write, and a 1 stands for execute. So 4 plus 2 plus 1 would mean that I'm allowing read, write, and execute to the user. 4 plus 0 plus 1 
is 5 which means I'm allowing read and execute for group so let's check it out using the ls command and as you can see now the group has the execute permission again if that description did not make sense verbally you can go ahead and check the companion blog post for a detailed description all right let's clear the console out and move along in the linux terminology a process is basically a program which is currently in execution carrying out a specific task processes are dynamic and constantly change as the user switches between applications. The Linux documentation talks about processes in great detail, so I highly encourage you go ahead and check it out once you are done with this video. On Linux, in order to see what processes are currently active, we use a command called a ps command. Let's man it out first. And as you can see, it says ps displays information about a selection of the active processes. We'll limit our scope to just finding out the processes that are running in root mode. So to do that, we are going to use PS along with the minus U option. And as you can see, it printed out a bunch of details, uh, which has the user, which is currently root, the process ID or the PID, along with other helpful statistics about each process. Now that we know how to view a process, how about we learn how to kill one? So let's assume an abstract scenario where this process with PID 1801 is misbehaving for some reason and it's causing my computer to crash. So in order to kill this process, I'll just use the kill command and all I need to supply is the PID of the misbehaving process. Now if I hit enter and then go ahead and do a PS minus U again, you can see that the process ID, that the process ID of that process has changed. It did however kill it, but since it's a system level process and requires to be up and running at all times, the system respawned it. That's all that we have for the processes part of this video. Let's move along now. We're almost nearing the end of part 2 of this series. And before closing the video off, uh, let's talk about a couple of text editors. We all use text editors in our day to day life. If you are a developer, you might be familiar with some of them like Visual Studio Code Atom or Sublime Text. I myself use Visual Studio Code quite extensively, but there's actually a text editor built into the terminal which allows you to do almost all of the things that a modern text editor would do, minus all the bells and whistles of autocomplete and other stuff. It's called nano, and to invoke it, you just issue the nano command along with the file name that you want to open. If the file does not exist, it would create a new file and open it for you. And if the file exists, it will open the existing file. So as you can see, we have the starwars.txt file. And now I can go ahead and navigate in this file using the up and down keys. I can add something to the end of the file. I can add something to the top of the file. And it's basically a regular text editor. All of the helpful commands uh, associated with nano are listed right here in the bottom so let's say if I have to go ahead and exit I'll press ctrl X and now it will prompt me saying if I want to save the changes or not let's say yes and hit enter and now if I cat this file you can see the edits are live there are other terminal based editors available for Linux uh, one of them would be VI or Vim as it's popularly known but I won't suggest you invest the time to go ahead and learn how to use Vim because it's really not worth the time learning a text editor where you'll most likely forget how to exit it. Alright that brings us to the end of part 2 of this series. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you do not miss out on any of our future content. If you like the video make sure you throw in a thumbs up. We'll be back again next week with part 3 of this series, but meanwhile, make sure you give yourself enough time to familiarize yourself with all the commands. And as always, make sure that you dive deep into each of the commands and customize it according to your own needs. Until next week, this is me Pratik, signing off.